All right, what's up, guys? Fly Stewie here. Um, just finished watching Andrew Yang's debate. Gonna go over everything he said in the debate. So let's get into it. Overall, I think he did a really fine job. Uh, a lot of his questions uh, were really good. Unfortunately, though, he only talked around six minutes in the whole debate, which of course was last place. Of course, MSNBC has been doing a great job and really fueling the fire to this let Yang speak media blackout narrative that's going on. And it looks like it's around the 16th time that they've kind of jived him. But further, with no further ado, let's get into it. Let's see what Andrew Yang said in the debate. Mr. Yang, you've made a virtue of your outsider status. You've never served in the military or in government. What has prepared you to respond to a terrorist attack or a major disaster? Well, first, I just want to stick up for Tom. We have a broken campaign finance system, but Tom has been spending his own money fighting climate change. And you can't knock someone for having money and spending it in the right way, in my opinion. <laughs> Thanks, Andrew. No problem. <laughs> Interestingly enough, I thought he was going to bring up dem democracy dollars uh, in his answer, but he didn't end up bringing it up. Democracy dollars, obviously, is his plan to get rid of these corrupt campaign financing initiatives that we have, basically by giving every American $100 to vote. If they don't use it, then they lose it, and it can only be used on voting. So I thought he was going to bring that up. He didn't, but I still do like his answer. Let's get into it. No problem. <laughs> As commander in chief, I think we need to be focused on the real threats of the 21st century. And what are those threats? Climate change, artificial intelligence, loose nuclear material, military drones, and non state actors. And if you look up, we're in the process of potentially losing the AI arms race to China right now because they have more access to more data than we do and their government is putting billions of dollars to work subsidizing the development of AI in a way that we are not. We are 24 years behind on technology. And I can say that with authority because we got rid of the Office of Technology Assessment in 1995. Think about that timing. I guess they thought they'd invented everything. The next commander in chief has to be focused on the true threats of tomorrow. And that's what I'll bring to the table as commander in chief. Thank you, Mr. Yang. Andrea? We now focus on an issue facing many Americans, child care and paid family leave. Here in Georgia, the average price of infant daycare can be as much as $8,500 per child per year. That's more than in-state tuition at a four-year public college in Georgia. Mr. Yang, what would you do as president to ease that financial burden? <laughs> there are only two countries in the world that don't have paid family leave for new moms, the United States of America and Papua New Guinea. That is the entire list, and we need to get off this list as soon as possible. I'm sorry, but that just sounds crazy. Like, what? Only two countries? Come on. That's insane. I would pass paid family leave as one of the first things we do. I have two kids myself who are four and seven, one of whom is autistic and has special needs, and it's breaking families' backs. We need to start supporting our kids and families from the beginning, because by the time they're showing up to pre-K and kindergarten, in many cases, they're already years behind. Studies have shown that two-thirds of our kids' educational outcomes are determined by what's happening to them at home. This is stress levels, number of words read to them as children, type of neighborhood, whether a parent has time to spend with them. So we need to have a freedom dividend in place from day one, $1,000 a month for every American adult, which would put in many cases $2,000 a month into families' pockets so that they can either pay for childcare or if they want, stay home with the child. We should not be pushing everyone to leave the home in, and go to the workforce. Many parents see that trade-off and say if they leave the home and work, they're going to be spending all the money on childcare anyway. In many cases, it would be better if the parent stays home with the child. Yeah, there was like a study where some, I forgot who did it, but it was around $80,000 of work was said by this study that basically stay-at-home mothers were doing while they're staying at home. So it is interesting how you know, the United States is one of the only countries that doesn't really have paid, you know, paid leave or paid leave when the mom's at home. So hitting on UBI, great time to really bring it in. $1,000 a month would be a game changer. Like it really helps out the people who are poor below the poverty line or staying at home. 
it is somewhat pretty good for the people in the middle class and upper middle class and upper class people are like a thousand dollars nice but doesn't really affect them so i love the universalness of it take out the bureaucracy don't make it means tested don't make it only for certain groups just give it to everyone it will cut down small government great answer to this question thank you mr yang mr yang if you win the 2020 election what would you say in your first call with russian president vladimir putin Okay, when he got this question, I was like, what? Yo, MSNBC hates this guy. Like, they just want him to be implicated with Putin so badly. They're like, Mr. Yang, tell us why Putin is your best friend. So I was really curious myself on how Andrew Yang was going to respond to this. Well, first I'd say, I'm sorry I beat your guy. <laughs> We're not sorry. sorry. Not sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and second, I would say the days of meddling in American elections are over, and we will take any undermining of our democratic processes as an act of hostility and aggression. The American people would back me on this. We know that they've found an underbelly and they've been clawing at it, and it's made it so that we can't even trust our own democracy. The third thing I would say is that we're going to live up to our international commitments. We're going to recommit to our partnerships and alliances, including NATO. And it was James Mattis that said that the more you invest in diplomats and diplomacy, the less you have to spend on ammunition. That has to be the path forward to help build an international consensus, not just against Russia, but also to build a coalition that will help us put pressure on China in terms of their treatment of their ethnic minorities and what's going on in Hong Kong. I want to propose a new world data organization, like a WTO for data, because right now, unfortunately, we're living in a world where data is the new oil and we don't have our arms around it. These are the ways that we'll actually get Russia to the table and make it so they have to join the international community and stop uh, resisting appeals to the world order. Thank you, Mr. Yang. Rachel? I mean, overall, just great answer. Um, I really liked it. It could have gone really, really south, but he just that first line talking about how Trump, I beat your man Poon just right on the money. I think he killed that. Mr. Yang, what would you do about the issue of white supremacist violence? Well, first, we have to designate white supremacist terrorism as domestic terrorism so that the Department of Justice can properly measure it. I talked to an anti-hate activist named Christian Picciolini, who told me about how he was radicalized uh, over a 10-year period. He said he was a lonely 14-year-old and that he was reached out to by a hate group and he wound up joining it for a decade. Now he's out and he's helping uh, convert people out of those hate groups and back into the rest of society. But what he told me was that if anyone had reached out to him when he was that hurt, broken 14-year-old boy, he would have gone with them. He said if it had been a coach, I would have gone with him. If it had been a mentor or teacher, I would have gone with them. But instead it was a hate group. So what we have to do is we have to get into the roots of our communities and create paths forward for men in particular who right now are falling through the cracks. And when you look at gun violence in this country, 96 plus percent of the shooters we're talking about are young boys and young men. We have to, as a country, start finding ways to turn our boys into healthy, strong young men who do not hate, but instead feel like they have paths forward in today's economy. Mr. Yang, thank you for that. I think that answer is very important. You know, I think with this election cycle and just in general, um, young men, especially young white men, have been typically going to the Republicans because the Republicans has been very spot on with this message. I think the Democrats definitely have to just have to do a better job with their messaging, not demonizing people for being young men and really getting back on brand and helping, you know, show that the Democrats are the party of young men. Thank you for that. I'm here with my wife, Evelyn, tonight. We have two young boys, Christopher and Damien. How many of you all are parents like us here in the room? So if you're a parent, you've had this thought. Maybe you've been afraid to express it. And it is this. Our kids are not all right. They're not all right because we're leaving them a future that is far darker than the lives that we have led as their parents. We are going through the greatest economic transformation in our country's history, the fourth industrial revolution, and it is pushing more and more of our people to the side. 
We talk as if Donald Trump is the cause of all of our problems. He is not. He is a symptom, and we need to cure the disease. Now, my first move was not to run for president of the United States, because I am not insane. <laughs> My first move was to, was to go to D.C., talk to our leaders and say, technology is ripping us apart, immigrants are being scapegoated, our kids are being left behind, and the American dream that my parents came here to find is dying before our eyes. And the people in Washington, D.C. had nothing for this. They don't want to touch it. They don't want to talk about an issue they don't think they have a solution for. I'm not running for president because I've fantasized about being president. I'm running for president because, like many of you here in this room tonight, I'm a parent and a patriot, and I have seen the future that we're leaving for our kids, and it is not something I'm willing to accept. We need to create a new way forward for our people. If you want to join us in rewriting the rules of the 21st century economy, go to yang2020.com and make it so that we can look our kids in the eyes and say to them, and believe it, your country loves you, your country values you, and you will be all right. Thank you, Mr. Yang. Man, I love that parent and patriot line. And in the end of the debate, he really honed in on talking about the kids, talking about the next generation and what it means for for the older generation to really leave a strong economy. You know, a study came out saying that this generation of kids coming out was the first one expected to do worse than their parents or have less wealth than their parents. And I like how Yang ended out strong. All in all, great debate. Really liked it. Um, as of now, Yang needs one more national poll at 4% to qualify the December debate. So let's see if this will do it. Um, and go Yang 2020. Of course, if you like the video, make sure to like and subscribe. This channel is about connecting investing to pop culture. So if you're into that, make sure to like and subscribe. And of course, we flight crew, we have to take off. See you guys next time.